from the Acts of the Apostles. Some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. So, being sent on their way by the church, they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, reporting the conversion of the Gentiles, and they gave great joy to all the brethren. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they declared all that God had done with them. But some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, It is necessary to circumcise them and to charge them to keep the law of Moses. The apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider this matter. The word of the Lord, thanks be to God. I rejoiced when I heard them say, Let us go to God's house. I rejoiced when I heard them say, Let us go to God's house. And now our feet are standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. I rejoiced when I heard them say, Let us go to God's house. Jerusalem is built as a city, strongly compact. It is there that the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord. I rejoiced when I heard them say, let us go to God's house. For His fairest glory it is, there to praise the Lord's name. They will set the clouds of judgment of the house of David. I rejoiced when I heard them say, let us go to God's house. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Christ has risen, He who created all things, and has brought it 
is blessed to me. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to his disciples, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch of mine that bears no fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You are already made clean by the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. If a man does not abide in me, he is cast forth as a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you will, and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. The 15th chapter of the book of the Acts is fairly central to the whole volume and we have in it the way in which for the first time in church history the equivalent of an ecumenical council is called. The apostles are there in union with Peter and we later on hear this expression coming from their deliberations. It has seemed well to the Holy Spirit and to us. Therefore, these pillars of the Church were very much aware that when together in this way they were able to claim, claim the promise of the Lord, that that spirit of truth would lead them into all truth. And that has been the experience of the Christian centuries. We notice that there are Pharisees amongst the believers, so one can understand how they would be unwilling to come out of the comfort zone. At least some observances which seem to be to them indispensable, notably the outward sign of circumcision. We notice, on the contrary, as we hear the words of the Lord in the upper room, 
given to us by St. John, but the atmosphere there is quite different. Indeed, in the upper room, the Lord points in a very different direction. He doesn't leave them, even in the Last Supper, a vast number of rubrics. He says, do this, so they have to repeat what he's doing, and adds in memory of him. He then is the lamb taking the place of the previous Paschal lamb, indicating the covenant is in his blood. But then, in that same context, he gives the essence of the law that he, the new Moses, is giving. A new commandment I give unto you, and by this shall men know that you are my, believe, my followers, my disciples. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. He goes further than the command on the level of the horizontal, amongst themselves, and goes into the very essence. He is indicating his divinity, his presence, and his presence in the soul. Only the Blessed Trinity can abide in the soul. And so, by giving this teaching, he is underlining also his divinity. Abide in me, and I in you. Just as we see that happening in every part of the vine. Using the vine, of course, in the context of the Last Supper. It would make contextual sense. And then he indicates how he, from this abiding in the disciples until the end of time, will also be the force at work. And that, by the way, is supremely valid for our time. One sees this kind of scenario. Why is such and such a Christian body so successful? Oh, let us imitate what they do, and then they invent new things, borrowing another context, not Catholic, to try and be spectacular and effective, often with short-lived fruits. We have the abiding, and actually supremely so. For when at Holy Communion we have that real presence in us, the intimacy with our Saviour is such that we would do better to say, rather than what can I do for you, Lord, all the time, all the time, simply to say, over to you, Lord. For when He, from within, inspires, it is quite different. How many good souls, good communities, have come to grief through taking on everything that passed through their mind and ended up by being too thinly spread. And in the interests of doing many things, were not able to dwell in the present moment and in the grace of just enjoying the gaze, that gaze which gives sense to all the rest. For at the end of life we have done many things for Jesus, but not had time to gaze into his eyes when we actually have allowed him to be Lord. On this day, we think of the way in which our Blessed Lady spoke very simply to simple people, but yet gave them to understand sufficient for even the wisest. What was the one thing she asked for each time in those six apparitions? She was the Lady of the Rosary, 
and she each time asked for the daily recitation thereof. It could be asked, why did she not ask for daily adoration, daily presence of the holy sacrifice of the Lord? Simply because it's the one thing that everyone on earth can do, even a child, even the Holy Father. And yet, how many of us are so busy doing things, of course, for the Lord, that that bit either doesn't happen or happens in a very, very mediocre fashion? Which brings me to one big point. We need on this day to ask whether that element of abiding and therefore relationship, not the religion that the Pharisees were coming from, is actually present in our prayer. Or are we falling into a new Phariseeism of getting through duties, a quantity of vocal prayer, observance of vocal prayer? It can be put like this, simply. If there is relationship and abiding, then the rest will follow. And there will be no moment of non-abiding. And so all will be mode of dialogue, mode of sharing with him, and in this case also with her. And therefore, spontaneously, one will drift into quiet moments, which might or might not include such and such a form of prayer. When we are doing simple work, or even travelling, one can also be using that time. And an excellent way at that point is a simple repeated prayer. Far from what the Lord was speaking of in the Sermon of the Mount, with regard to vain repetitions. It is our duty to make sure that our mantra is not a vain repetition but a kind of music that actually creates an atmosphere where we're free to engage. But the engagement must happen. Two things. The teaching on the abiding is central. I remember being given this book early on in formation in France. It was by a good Jesuit. And he indicated that the worst tragedy in the Christian family is that so few engage and so many practice but actually don't have the actualization of the life of grace which is Trinitarian. They don't engage with the presence within them. Jesus is not a friend. But the other is this. A tragedy across the Christian world is this. Many of our prayers are not prayed. At Garabandal, Our Lady gave a quiet hint to mankind. It was this. She allowed the children to be taught by herself how to say the rosary. It was very slow and it can be picked up on tape. Similarly, earlier in time, that same Lady of the Rosary had taught Bernadette at Lourdes to make the sign of the cross well. The hand could not move. She was going to do it very quickly. And miraculously, she was taught how to make the sign of the cross well. So anything we do must be an expression of relationship and not of religion. Lovers find their own language, which only they understand. Do we love Jesus and Mary, or do we observe a minimal practice to make sure that our duty is done? They're two very different concepts and worth distinguishing.
et bibite ex eo hobnes, hic est enim calix sanguinis mei, nomi et eterni testamenti, qui pro vobis et pro mortis et fundetur in remissione peccatorum, hoc facit in meam commemorationem. Mysterio Mafiei, Mortem Tuam Nunciamus Domine, Et Tuam Resurrectionem Confitemur, Donec Venias. Memore Sigitur Mortis et Resurrectione Seius, Tibi Domine Panem Vitae et Calicem Solutis Operibus, Grazias agentes mio nostinio sabuisti a stare corante et tibi ministrare. Et supplices de precamur, ut corpore sed sanguinis Christi participes, a spiritu sancto congrece more nudo. Et cortare domine et crisi e tu, tutto orbe de fosse, ut ea me caritate perficias, una cum papa nostro Francisco, et episcopo nostro Toma, et universo tre. Emento et sia fratrum nostor, qui spede su lexionis dormierunt, omnium qui et tua miserazione defuntor. Et eo si lumen mutus tui admite. Omnium nostrum qui sumus miserere, ut cum beata te e celetrice Virgin de Maria, beato Iosef e Uspons, beatis apostolis et omnibus sanctis, qui tibi a seculo procurent, et terni vite mele amoressi consortes, et te laudemus et glorificemus, per filium tu, Iesum Christu. Per ipso, per cum ipso, et per ipso, est tibi Deo Patri Omnipotenti, et non itate Spiritu Sancti Omnis Honor et Gloria, per omnia secula seculorum. Amen.